Hi everyone. For today's video, we're going to be uh, looking at a summary of the 1950 Alan Turing paper called Computing and Machinery Intelligence, or more famously known as The Imitation Game. Yep, the same imitation game as the 2014 film. For those of you that aren't familiar, Alan Turing was a math genius who helped crack the Enigma machine during World War II. In this video, I'll give you a summary of each chapter of his paper and conclude with my thoughts on his work and how it's still so relevant to computing today. Chapter 1. The Imitation Game In the first chapter, Turing starts off with one innocuous question. Can computers think? In 1950, this may have seemed silly because it was impossible. Computers as we know them, or digital desktop computers, didn't exist until 1964. So the computers of the 1950s were basically calculators, all mechanical. Turing later transforms his question into a simple game, saying if you're an interrogator and you're texting two people, person A and person B, you know one of them is a man and the other is a woman. Can you find out which is which? If we replace one of them with a computer, is that any easier? The purpose of Turing's game is that he's trying to show us that in the future it will not be easy to find out if the entity we're communicating with is a computer or a human. A few years ago, Google showcased a version of the Google Assistant that can call and book appointments on your behalf. The people on the other end of the phone didn't realize that they were talking to a computer. We'll explore why it's so difficult later on. Chapter 2 Criticism of the Problem this chapter is a criticism of the game. If you were to ask a human to add 34,957 to 707,764, they wouldn't be able to answer you instantly. Whereas in this game, it would be obvious which player is the computer because of the speed of their re response. Turing addresses this and says if you programmed a 30 second delay, the players would remain indistinguishable. For the sake of ease and time, we've combined chapters 3, 4, and 5 as they all cover the same large topic, the digital machine itself. For the sake of accuracy, Turing defines what is a machine and what is not. He says a person operating a computer is not considered a thinking machine because there is a biological entity involved. So the machine needs to be a digital computer. According to Turing, a digital computer needs to have store, executive unit, and control. Not unlike our modern digital computers, except we call them RAM, or memory, CPU, and control is the instruction table, which is part of the CPU. In reading Turing's paper, it's fascinating that his hypothetical description is still fairly accurate to a digital computer built 70 years later. Chapter 6. The Haters In this section, he explores a variety of objections people come up with to distinguish a thinking computer from a human mind. This part was the most entertaining to read because it's basically a scientist arguing with religion, superstition, and skeptics. Let's explore some of the objections. God didn't give a soul to the computer. Turing asks why religions believe animals don't have souls. Is it because their brain wasn't complex enough to be worthy of having a soul? If yes, then if a computer's brain becomes complex enough, will God give it a soul? I mean, God is capable of doing it, so why can only humans have souls and not equally, or dare I say more advanced, computer brains in the future? Number 2. The consequences of a thinking machine are too dreadful. Who knew the Terminator was already a concern in the 1950s? Here Turing argues that this comes from humanity's sense of superiority. He says, We like to believe that man is in some subtle way superior to the rest of creation. Why do we think like that? And is it true? Will a thinking machine be superior to us? Yes or no, this doesn't mean that it is impossible to have a thinking machine. 3. Digital computers can't save every possible scenario and respond like a human. Turing acknowledges that there are limitations to capabilities of digital computers, but there are also limitations to humans. And a computer can cover a huge number of possibilities with a small amount of memory, unlike humans. 4. Consciousness. This is an interesting one. Turing quotes Professor Jefferson's paper, The Mind of a Mechanical Man, in which he says, Not until a machine can write a sonnet or compose a concerto because of thoughts and emotions felt, and not by the chance fall of symbols, could we agree that machine equals brain. This argument ignores the question of Turing's paper, which is, Can computers think? So although computers may not be able to feel emotions, it doesn't mean they cannot think or at least be indistinguishable from a thinking human. 
Number five, computers aren't able to do this or that. Meaning, computers may be good at one thing, but are not good at everything. Turing asks the reader to compare a computer with a child's brain and provide the same amount of information that a child's brain receives to mature. Then see if the computer can do everything that a human brain can do. Number six, computers can do whatever we tell them to do. This isn't always true because we can tell a computer to be random. We can program it to give us any number between 1 and 1,000 without being able to predict its response with 100% accuracy. Then the computer may or may not do what we tell it to do. Number seven, the difference between a nervous system and a digital computer. Turing agrees with this, but says under the conditions of the imitation game, where computer and human don't have direct contact other than text communication, these differences don't make the game any easier for the interrogator. Number eight, humans behave differently under the same rules. Turing says there are two types of rules, rules of conduct and rules or laws of behavior. The rule of conduct, for example, is when you get to a traffic light, you're supposed to stop, but this rule can be broken. Circumstances can override the correct response. But the laws of behavior are significantly more rigid. For example, the laws of physics. You may want to teleport to work, avoiding the traffic altogether, but the laws of physics will not allow you. Chapter 7, Learning Machines. In the last chapter, he introduces the concept of learning machine, which is extraordinary because nowadays we hear the words such as AI and machine learning all the time, and it's normal. But 70 years ago, Turing was doing the unimaginable. He was comparing a computer's learning process to a child. He said, instead of trying to produce a program that simulates the adult mind, why not try to produce one that simulates the child's? He imagines if we have a computer capable of learning the same as a child's brain, it can be stimulated to develop into an equivalent of an adult brain. Meaning, in the future, we would be able to have computers that learn. Conclusion Alan Turing was an extraordinary scientist whose imagination was beyond his time. We have only recently started to see his realizations of what computers could be and we still have a long way to go. The purpose of this video was to introduce you to well-known scientific papers. I believe more people need to read scientific papers. It shouldn't be limited to just grad students and professors. Do you know any scientific papers that would be worth reviewing? Let me know if you have suggestions in the comments below. Thanks for staying with me during this video. See you on the next one.